<laughs> so, all right. Well, as far as um, requests for interviews and people reminiscing with you about your marriage to Sally Ride and your friendship, has that escalated because of this 40th anniversary? Um, I would say so. Uh, in fact, it had escalated to the point where I started asking myself, is something going on? And then uh -huh. I realized it was the 40th anniversary <laughs> of That's great. STS-7. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had not, you know, I had not processed that until mm -hmm. I was getting requests to talk about Sally. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, was wondering, you know, I'm a, that's, you know, that's an interesting request. I get some of them from time to time, but mm -hmm. I was getting more than normal. Right. Well, and, and there have been a few biographies and great stories written about her. And I haven't <coughs> read any of them completely, but I assume that you were interviewed for those as well. Yeah. Yeah. Lynn Shear wrote probably yes. the, you know, the comprehensive story about Sally mm -hmm. in her biography. Mm hmm and she was a friend of both of yes. yours. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we had known Lynn. Uh, uh, <laughs> she was a really good friend and, and uh, has stayed, you know, good friends mm -hmm. over the years. And I'm still in touch with her uh, even now. Well, right, because she was going to help us with the event that we were going to right. have. It, you know, yes. COVID, another COVID canceled event. So did you know Sally before you were part of the astronaut class together? No. Uh -uh. No. No. So. Although... Uh, this is a true story, although it may sound contrived. I, mm -hmm. um, I had always assumed when I applied that I would not be picked. And so I never really did the analysis of, you know, is it a smart move to give up a promising career in astrophysics for a two-year temporary position at NASA uh, where I might not you know, make the cut. And I remember when, when George, George Abbey called and told me I'd been selected and I agreed to accept hmm. that I had not really thought that through. And what I rationalized to myself was, you know, this is your basic once in a lifetime opportunity. And so that, you know, I'm gonna do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say within two weeks, I had a chance to, I was in Chile at the time, and I saw a newspaper, and uh, the, the, the newspaper article was about this woman physicist from Stanford named Sally Ride. And somebody had asked her, you know, why would you, you know, agree to, you know, go work for NASA? And she said, because it's basically your once in a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> she said exactly the same thing that I was thinking, but I hadn't met her yet. Mm -hmm. But that was my first awareness of, of who she was. Right, and that sense of connection, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> at least in reasoning. So ast astronaut class eight, the 35 new guys, right? right? So that was a big shift for NASA mm -hmm. because Prior to that, um, I believe all the astronauts were test pilots. Um, with the exception of, uh, there, there was a class selected in 1967 mm -hmm. that was primarily scientists. There was some engineers. Um, so they were not test pilots, but the first year that they worked for NASA, they got sent to pilot training. <laughs> so they became pilots, not test pilots, but they all had to learn how to be jet pilots. So technically they weren't all military test pilots, but most of them were. Mm -hmm. And certainly all of them were pilots that had gone through military flight training until the 35 new guys. Right. And 35 in the class of the eighth class versus seven in the seventh. So that was a, a big jump. Even some of the photos are hilarious. They just hadn't, NASA hadn't thought yet how to stage a big group photo. <laughs> <laughs> those, those were really amusing. So with the 35 new guys, there were all these firsts. And not only that, but the role of mission specialist was introduced for the first time. So was that distracting? Did it feel like a burden to be part of all of that newness at NASA? How was that environment? Uh, well, it was, 
I, I considered it to be a great privilege. Um, I probably initially had, I guess, what do they call it, imposter syndrome when <laughs> you know, I'm in this room with 34 other newly selected astronaut candidates and I'm listening to what they all had done and thinking, you know, wow, that's an amazing group of people. <laughs> you know, why am I here? Um, so, yeah, so I thought it was a privilege. I think many of us uh, understood that um, we were kind of representing something new. Um, in, in particular, in my case, because I could relate, I wanted to be an astronomer since I was really young, but I was aware of astronauts and I followed the space program closely and actually thought about putting telescopes in space one day. But I knew there was no chance I could be an astronaut because the astronauts were all test pilots. Back then, certainly they were. Um, but now, I think I and, and many of my friends knew that we represented you know, a goal that other young boys and girls could aspire to. Because now you can be an engineer, a doctor, a scientist, uh, and have a chance to become an astronaut. And so that was a big change. And I, I think we felt kind of proud that, you know, whether or not I deserved to be there, I was there. And so that, you know, young kids, if they wanted to, could at least know they could apply someday and they could tailor their preparation to make them as competitive as possible. And that was different. I never, I, I kind of fell into it because I never thought I would have a chance to apply. Um, it just turned out for me, kind of being in the right place at the right time, when I was getting my PhD and looking for a job. And at that time, NASA started taking applications for you know this new program called the Space Shuttle. And they were looking for some of the skills that I had. And again, you know that wasn't my career plan. I was going to become a research scientist. But um, so that that changed forevermore with you know, the selection of the TFNGs. Hmm. So you were a young man, even a child, thinking we could put a telescope in space. And when that class, the TFNGs, were selected, was Hubble already in the works? Hubble, it depends on what you mean by in the works. About the time we were selected, uh, Hubble was authorized by Congress. Um, I remember the last, probably the last semester that I was teaching at KU, um, I was preparing to talk to some majors in my class about some recent Hubble discovery when I looked out and I saw that they were all younger than 28. <laughs> and so it occurred to me as far as they know, Hubble's always been there. And so I, I said, well, I'm gonna tell them how Hubble came to be instead of talking about the latest, you know, Quasar or black hole discovery. And it, it started in 1946 with a paper written by a famous astronomer, Lyman Spitzer, talking about the advantages of putting a, a modest sized telescope in space. And um, it, was an, it was an important vision, but it needed advocacy. And so some of the big heavyweights in astronomy for the next decade or two argued in favor of Dr. Spitzer's idea that, yes, it would be transformative if we could have a big telescope in space. Um, and, and that was important because it, it's a little bit unusual to have a community come together behind one idea because there's a limited amount of money, for, particularly for scientific research, and if they spend it on that, they're not going to spend it on my particular research interests. And so I could be compromising my own research to advocate for something that is arguably for the greater good. But that's what the community did. And ultimately, Congress was convinced to authorize funding for it. And that, like I said, that was in about 77, 78, when we were selected. So yeah, in a sense, Hubble was was already in work as a now funded project, but it was gonna be, of course, you know, 12 more years before we would launch it. Although, when I was originally assigned to the Hubble 
deployment mission uh, was assigned 1985 and the launch was going to be 1986. So um, at least some parts of the project were ready to go. I don't think we would have made 86 anyway, but of course we didn't because of the Challenger accident. But, you know, the development of Hubble took, you know, 10 years or so. Uh, and uh, of course then it went on orbit and it's been on orbit for 33 years. I think it had a 15 year design lifetime. So it far ex exceeded our expectations, both in terms of longevity and I think in terms of science. I remember when we were deploying it on STS-31, you know, I had an idea of how revolutionary it would be for my discipline. And I think I was conservative in my estimate of what it would do. Um, so yeah, at the time we were aware that Hubble was in development, at least I was, I mean, maybe some of the others were. Um, although that mission, you know, we hadn't flown anything <laughs> when we were selected. Uh, SCS-1 was still, well, at that time it was probably still a year away. It ended up being more like, you know, three years away. Um, so I, I remember, you didn't ask me this, but I, I remember a few years ago I did an interview where uh, I was asked, you know, what did it feel like when you were selected by NASA and you knew you were going to fly in space? And I said, I didn't know I was going to fly in space. I was selected as an astronaut candidate, which was a two-year job. I didn't know that I'd still be a NASA employee after two years. And he said, well, okay, so after you were promoted to astronaut and now how did it feel knowing you were going to fly in space? I said, well, that happened in 1979 and we hadn't flown SGS-1 yet. You know, what if it didn't work? I, I didn't know that that I was going to get to fly in space. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we were all kind of, I think our horizon at that time was probably STS-1. You know, we all needed to make STS-1 successful or there wasn't going to be much of a career for any of us. It's fascinating. So many parts of that are fascinating to me. So, first of all, the, the unknowns as that class came together. But back to what you were saying about everyone who had to give something up for the greater good. And I don't think the general public realizes that people can wait their entire career to get an experiment on the International oh, yeah. Space Station. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly the, the slice of the pie out of the congressional budget for space research and for NASA is so tiny. Mm -hmm. And people hear the figure and think it's enormous, right. but they don't realize what it means that all those researchers yielded their own interest and their own passion to Hubble and, and probably laid the foundation for Webb and everything that followed. Right, so. I mean, you're right that many people devote basically their entire career on one goal, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's putting, you know, Hubble in orbit or putting an instrument aboard Hubble. Um, as a graduate student, you probably don't, you probably want to avoid those guys because it could take you, you know, 20 years to get your degree. <laughs> <laughs> right. You follow them down their own rabbit hole. <laughs> right. Uh, but, but, you know, it's that kind of, and again, that was part of my message to the, my astronomy class was, mm -hmm. you know, these, you know, great things don't just happen. It takes people who are willing to devote their talents and their time, possibly for a long time, mm -hmm. and deal with all of the impediments and obstacles that come up in, right. in order to make something like that happen. Mm -hmm. And Webb's another good example. I, I remember um, 20 years ago, we were, I was talking with some of the managers at headquarters, and we were discussing, I was an advocate of continuing to service Hubble on orbit, but there were others who felt, ah, eh, you know, it's run its course. You know, we're going to have James Webb in, you know, in orbit, you know, in a few years. And uh, of course, it turned out it was about 20 years before that <laughs> happened. <laughs> right. But, you know, people spent a long time trying to make it a reality. And, and certainly in the case of Hubble and, and Webb, the, you know, success speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Webb's only been there a short time, relatively oh speaking. So right, someday, we'll, when I'm all settled in, 
We're going to sit out on your patio and you're going to use really small words and explain <laughs> some of it to me. Like, not, not to a student here, but maybe if you were talking to a kindergarten class. And then I could understand this whole speck on the end of your finger thing. <laughs> like, wait. <laughs> anyway, it's amazing. So back to the class and to Sally. Um, do you remember, so you'd heard of her, or at least read this article when you right. were in Chile. And um, do you remember your first impressions of Sally Ride? Um, not, not specifically, but I remember uh, Bob Parker was one of the astronauts from the uh, 1967 class. Who were, he was an astronomer and ended up, you know, they sent him to pilot training. <laughs> but uh, he invited the astronomers and physicists over to his house. And so there was a small group of us there that included Sally. And that was probably my first chance to, to really uh, visit with her and learn a little bit about you know, what she did. And um, that happened in February of 78, where we were uh, all flown to Houston for a media availability. The announcement was in January and then first of February, we were in Houston. Um, and so that was really the first chance I had to meet her. But, but I mean, she and, and I think particularly the other women and the minority astronaut candidates as well, it may have been a little intimidating for me because they were, you know, they were special. They were, you know, everybody wanted to talk to them. Everybody wanted to, you know, the press wanted to interview them and, and, you know, they were celebrities and, you know, we weren't, <laughs> which was fine with me. I was content to be a nobody, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, I think I was probably a little intimidated by the fact that, you know, they were famous already. Um, and, you know, I was just, you know, one of the guys. One of the guys <laughs> who I, I'm going to digress for just a second and say, as I was reading back over your bio, I realized you have more awards than anybody I've ever read about in NASA. Just saying. Well, I was there for a long time. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll call in your therapist next. Because <laughs> that needs to be embraced. That was, it was just amazing, all the things you've done. So... I think that it's interesting that you brought up that sense of celebrity that they had without wanting it. You know, um, I'm sure everything you read about Sally Ride and the fact that then from that class of first, she was chosen to be the first woman, but that had to happen because she was also brilliant. Yeah, um, um, I you know don't know all of the behind the scenes deliberations that took place uh, regarding who should be first. Um, in my opinion, I thought Sally and, and JR, uh, Judy Resnick, were the two that were technically the most qualified. Um, there were, I know secondhand that there were other points of view that, you know, this was going to be important, you know, from a public perception point of view. And, and I, would, I would say Sally was not the one that was most comfortable dealing with the press. Uh, Ray was certainly, I think Anna was. Uh, so in that sense, you know, they might have been uh, the choice for some in management who wanted somebody that was really comfortable representing NASA and the program and this role to the public. Um, I felt like yeah, that's an important consideration, but I thought it was more important that whoever this person is as the first woman has to succeed. She has to be seen as competent. Um, and frankly, um, it didn't last too long, but uh, there was an attitude even within the astronaut office that, you know, what are we going to do with scientists and women, you know, and there was a lack of, uh, I guess, until we had a chance to prove ourselves, there was kind of a lack of confidence that we'd be able to do the job. And so it was certainly important to the public that a woman could be seen as, you know, extremely competent crew member on a 
on a mission, it was also important to you know the colleagues in the astronaut office to, to prove that as well. So I thought that was the most important qualification was somebody that you really believed you know could do the job and do it well. Sure, and she was a woman and a scientist. She was, yes. So she uh -huh. was able to prove the capacity in both yeah. cases. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and, and and I think once we started flying. The attitude I described was far more prevalent before STS-1. I think once we started flying and people saw, you know, how their other colleagues in the astronaut office performed, the jobs they were doing, how well they were doing it, it, you know, it went away. Mm -hmm. But there was a period of time where, you know, I felt like, you know, scientists and in particular the women, you know, were having to prove themselves to the, to their colleagues. Right. For some reason, scientists and the work scientists do compared to a person with military experience or as a daring test pilot, that they, they aren't the same as far as qualities, <laughs> but they're very important qualities to have. And I think in some cases, you can have the same. I, I, an obvious question over the years has been, um, you know, was it a real culture shock? to the astronaut office to ha suddenly have women and minorities. Mm -hmm. And I always answered that by saying, well, yeah, but I thought that the bigger culture shock was having what I described as hardcore civilians, you know, like me and Pinky Nelson and Sally. And the um, way I described it once was, you know, if you, you get a procedure, you know, a, a military pilot will look at it and start thinking about how am I going to execute it? You know, the scientists might look at it and go, yeah, I don't think I'd have written it that way. <laughs> but That's I think great. over time, the two cultures really worked well together. And I thought we ended up in a good place. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, the combination of the discipline of the military, but uh, maybe the ability to be creative of the scientist. That's it. I read something that um, I can't remember where, but it said that many of the Apollo era astronauts may have fought in the Vietnam War, whereas some of the scientists in your class may have been protesting the <laughs> Vietnam War. That's quite possible. So, yeah. but still coming together to serve our country in space <clears throat> with the talents that they possess. I think um, back to Sally that you mentioned that she wasn't comfortable necessarily with the media and tell me a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, she and I were alike, I think in the sense that neither of us suffer fools very graciously. <laughs> and um, in particular once, well, it started, of course, the six women were, were unique. And, and I remember it was within a few weeks of our arrival in Houston that, um, I think it was about 16 of us got sent off to water survival because uh, we hadn't had it. A lot of the military mission specialists had been through water survival, but we hadn't. So we got sent to an Air Force program in Florida. Uh, and there were, uh, NASA put out a press release saying we were going to be there and including, you know, the fact that women were going to be there. And so the press was there and they were hounding the, you know, they ignored me, which was fine, but they were hounding the women and, and every time, you know, they were going through some training exercise, there'd be people filming it. If, you know, we were walking from one venue to another, reporters would be running around shouting questions at them. And, you know, she didn't really, <coughs> I mean, other people might've liked that sort of thing, but, but Sally didn't, I, I didn't either, but I didn't have to deal with it to the extent that she did. And, and of course, as, she became even more famous by being assigned to STS-7. You know, there's even more attention and more dumb questions. And uh, there's a famous exchange. I think Lynn writes about it in, in her book. Uh, if, and if I remember the details properly, it was at a pre-flight press conference with the crew and some reporter asked her, you know, when you're in the simulator and things, you know, problems are happening, do you cry? And I think Sally paused for a second, and then I believe she said, 
why doesn't anybody ever ask Rick that question? Meaning Rick Howe, the pilot. And then Crip said, and the commander cries. <laughs> That's one of my favorite yeah. stories. And I think- But, you know, that was, you know, she, she was subjected to a lot of that sort of stupid questioning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, you could, you know, a lot of ways you could deal with it, but she, you know, she didn't make any secret of the fact that she thought these guys were idiots. <laughs> right. And then I loved the, I loved the response, the collegial nature of the response, you know, yeah. with her crewmate. Yeah. So I think that's just outstanding. It was interesting to me. So you and I had a conversation about, um, let me see if I remember, STS-41D, when the, you were uh, concerned about, or everyone was concerned about an icicle that had formed uh, outside of the not valve, but what, however you let the nozzle, fresh, water dump nozzle. Yeah, yeah, the water dump. And um, I was reading that Sally was among the group selected to problem solve that and then was right. the voice of mission control to tell you how right. to solve the problem. She was also selected to both um, the Challenger and Columbia investigation teams. What about her do you think made her fit for that kind of assignment? The the problem solving. Well, um, I remember when we were going through astronaut candidacy, it was supposed to be a two year program. And as I had mentioned, you know, STS-1 was slipping and there was a lot of work to do. And I remember as a group, we sort of wanted to be more involved in trying to help get Columbia airborne. And we sort of, uh, we're asking George and John Young, who's chief of the astronaut office, you know, whether we could be allowed to, you know, take on some assignments in support of, of the STS-1 mission. And uh, they allowed that. Uh, and then I think it was in August of 79, so it was just a little over a year after we arrived, they told us we were all promoted. And then, okay, now we're free to to begin, you know, really working on, on different aspects of the program. The reason I mention that is because then we all got specific, what we call technical assignments. Um, I was assigned to work on the validation of the flight software. Sally was assigned to work on the development of the robot arm, uh, which was scheduled to fly on the second shuttle flight. And so, uh, that's what she did, and you know, what I did was, you know, working on the software. Um, so she became something of a of an arm expert, um, and uh, and of course they flew the arm on on SCS seven, and she got to operate it. And so she, there were others who were, John Fabian was an arm expert also, um, but she had had some years of experience with it, and so when the solution to our problem came down to a pro, uh, procedure using the arm, um, you know, she was an obvious person to be involved in, and having used the arm in orbit on SCS-7, she was able to talk to us uh, on Discovery about the procedure and some things to look for and cautions and, and um, I didn't operate the arm, I was not the arm operator on that mission, but I think that it probably gave us confidence to know that you know she and the others had been through this and they had a procedure they had confidence would work and mm -hmm. and that it would be safe and and um, and that's what we did and it did work and uh, now in terms of the Challenger Commission um, I don't know exactly uh, how Sally came to be picked but. It seemed to me to make sense to have an astronaut as a commissioner, um, particularly since, well, we didn't know a lot of the details initially that we learned later on, but obviously this was of great importance to the, you know, astronaut community. Uh, of course, Neil was a commissioner, but Neil wasn't a shuttle astronaut. And so um, I think it was, it was important probably for us but it was probably also important for the public to know that, you know, 
shuttle astronauts were being represented in uh, understanding what happened and in recommending what needed to be done going forward. Um, she was the one most visibly involved as a commissioner. There were other astronauts that were involved in the commission work, including me. I was uh, there part-time. Brewster Shaw and John Fabian, I think, were there full-time from the outset. Um, I was sent to Florida initially to work on the investigation there. And I did that for probably a couple of months before then I got, uh, I got assigned to the commission as a staffer. Um, and so we had a lot of astronaut involvement, but she was the one that was, you know, visibly representing, you know, the astronaut concerns and, and the fact that, you know, we were part of the determination of what happened and we were going to be part of the plan that was going to represent how the program would be executed in the future. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting to me um, that she doesn't necessarily fit the mold in that she didn't decide she wanted to be an astronaut, focus on that entirely. For a bit, she thought maybe she'd play professional tennis. But as a young child, the two of you share that you had a passion for astronomy. And in each case, you were each gifted a telescope <laughs> by your parents. And did you ever share any of those memories of what it felt like when you were little looking through those telescopes? I don't remember talking about that specifically, although um, I, I think it was important that as a young boy mm -hmm. and a young girl, that we're both passionate about something. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the passion for science that allowed us to be in the right place at the right time uh, when NASA was looking for, for shuttle astronauts. Mm -hmm. um, I've had over the years, a lot of students come and say, you know, hey, they're interested in working for NASA or being astronauts. Um, do I need to take astronomy? <laughs> and I say, well, um, no. I said, Good, because I don't like astronomy, <laughs> and I said, "Well, that, that's fine. You know, find something you do like. You know, because if you don't, if you're doing it just because you think it's going to help you go work for NASA, you're probably not going to do it very well because you aren't passionate about it. You need to find something you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And and we were both passionate about about science, and um, I think it helped both of us end up being part of the TFNGs. We didn't talk about science a lot. Um, <laughs> frankly, because uh, I think we both felt from the beginning um, that if I'm really going to be successful, there are other things I need to worry about. I mean, I need to worry about, you know, shuttle software, or I need to worry about thermal control systems, or, or uh, how the RMS works. Um, I think I published one paper after I reported for duty at NASA. Um, I thought, frankly, that I would have time to continue to do some research and that would be a hedge in case I got punted after the first two years, <laughs> I could go back to <laughs> doing astronomy. Uh, but I quickly realized that was impractical. Uh, and, and she did too. And, and I think uh, part of that was we both felt it would be important to learn as much as we could about this vehicle we were going to fly. But also, frankly, that became what we were interested in. Uh, you know, I was really interested in learning as much as I could about how all these things worked, and Sally was too. So we didn't really miss the fact that we weren't doing science anymore. Right. And then returning to science was a choice, and you both returned to um, teaching physics, with both professors. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that it all did evolve that way, but not exactly because you were punted. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> so one other thing that I think is fun that the public may not understand is that it wasn't all just learning the shuttle. It wasn't, I know you've been referred to as the human computer <laughs> of the space shuttle for your part in the software. Um, there was fun and and music. So tell me about Max Q, the rock band, 
And uh, was that all um, members from the class of 35? Almost, or? not quite. Okay. Well, what happened after Challenger um, and after the commission had issued its report and the program was now in a, a phase where we're spending more time, uh, we were going through requirements, we were going through redesigns, we were looking at our operational practices, um, we were not quite ready to fly. And uh, several of us felt like um, maybe we should do some uh, event that was kind of a morale boost for the national office. And I think it was Sonny Carter's idea originally. Um, so uh, we organized a sock hop and um, Brewster Shaw and Hoot Gibson and Pinky Nelson uh, had from time to time sort of gotten together just to play guitar. They were guitar players and, and they agreed uh, to play a few songs at the sock hop. Well, then they decided they needed a drummer and Jim Weatherby uh, owned a set of drums. Jim was from the next class, group nine. Uh, is that right? No, I think he was 84. So he was maybe group 10, but anyway, he owned his own drums. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> he, he joined and there were four, four of them that played for the sock hop. And I think they played three songs and the crowd seemed to like it. Hoot, I think his, his quote afterwards was, we weren't good, but we weren't bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided that what they were lacking was a keyboard. And my mom had made me take piano lessons when I was a kid. So I still kind of remembered how to play. And so I went to the guys and I told them, you know, what you, what, you know, it's really great, but what you need is a keyboard. And they agreed. And so I remember driving downtown, <laughs> downtown Houston to a music store and buying a keyboard. <laughs> and I started playing with them. And we were actually a little bit of a thing for a while <laughs> anyway. <laughs> we would practice in the astronaut gym and, and we got to where we would play um, uh, some NASA events. Uh, and we played at least one wedding that I remember. And we played uh, at an event at a hotel just outside the gate of Johnson Space Center on the 20th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing. Um, and that turned out to be kind of a big deal and that was lots of fun. And, and we played together. Well, I left JSC in 1990 to go to NASA Ames. And so at that point I had to quit playing. Brewster left, uh, Hoot left in the mid nineties. So the original Max Q's, uh, went their separate ways. Uh, the Max Q brand still exists and several iterations of the band have existed over the years, but we were the original and, um, and the best I've watched all, <laughs> I've watched it all. We, I'm we kind got, of a nerd when it comes to things like that. I'm, I'm trying to think, was it 2019 that we went, we played Space Fest in Tucson, might've been 2019. And we played, uh, last year with the Orlando Philharmonic. Uh, so we don't get to play very often. So that's, a, that's the big leagues. Yeah, I was a little nervous about it because, <laughs> uh, yeah, we you know we don't we don't pl practice you know together anymore because we're not you know in the same place. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether we'll ever play again, but it was great fun to be part of that, and um, yeah, I feel very lucky that they allowed a keyboardist into the into the group. I just think the whole story is great. I think the name is great. I think everything about the yeah, group is great. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, if people don't know, the name comes from that portion of Ascent, which is referred to as Max Q, which is an um, aeronautical term for uh, maximum aerodynamic pressure. So you're getting the most, it's a combination of velocity of the spacecraft and you still have sensible density in the atmosphere. And so you're putting a lot of pressure on the vehicle. Um, and I always felt that, well, that's a good descriptor because that's what we were good at. We create a lot of acoustic pressure. 
<laughs> That's hilarious. I was thinking maybe it was because you were under pressure, but I love that story. <laughs> and one of my most profound personal moments was when we had the leadership forum and Jerry Bostick was describing that um, the day before you all came for um, our event in December. And he said, at that point, we deaccelerate. And I thought, as humans, particularly post-COVID, we have been hitting the accelerator and doing more and more, faster and faster, <laughs> initially to make up for what we'd lost in 2020. But it's as if when you get in those points of pressure that you feel like you have to push through it. And I realized it's not about accelerating through it. It's about deaccelerating. It's about breathing. surviving it. <laughs> surviving it. Yes, it, that's why. And perhaps. in our case, anyway, yeah, we did that by throttling the engines back mm -hmm. to reduce the the thrust, so we could survive that high pressure area. Just I had occasion to, uh, not sure why, but I was looking at a video of SCS thirty one, and. Uh, I remember uh, I, I saw Kathy Thornton was was one of the, the Capcoms. She might have been our planning shift Capcom, but it was right before entry, and she uh, called up and said she had a message for MS2. That was me, mm -hmm. and she said that um, be advised that Max Q's practice is Sunday at seven o'clock at the gym. They want you to be there. <laughs> And I made it. <laughs> that was one of the times we actually landed the day we were supposed to. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> and the show went on. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I wonder, with everything that's been asked of you and everything you've been thinking about um, recently, about the legacy of that class, and in particular of Sally Ride, what do you think... Um, maybe we should reflect on and, and know and remember about her. What's, what's the most important thing? L let me say first that um, I think the TFNG class um, ended up sort of defining the shuttle generation. Uh, when we showed up, we were not, you know, we were the new guys and there were still some Apollo guys around and, and they flew the first flights, but it wasn't too long before, you know, the TFNGs were basically running the show in the astronaut office. Um, and I'm really proud of that. Mm -hmm. And I do take a lot of pride on behalf of all of us that, you know, we, I'd like to think we're sort of formed the shuttle generation. Mm -hmm. um, specifically in Sally's case, um, of course, you know, she set the precedent that, you know, a woman astronaut can do anything that a male astronaut can do. Um, but I think maybe particularly 45 years, you know, later from the time we were picked, 40 years from the time she flew, mm -hmm. um, people may not have known or remember, you know, how much pressure she was under. Um, there's no doubt that she knew that, you know, whatever she did, good, bad, or indifferent, you know, was going to reflect on all of the women to come. Um, and that was pre-flight, it was in-flight, and it was after the flight. Um, and I, I can tell you for sure that I know how much pressure she was under in all of those different phases. I think the flight itself was probably the easiest for her. Mm. And she was confident that um, she could do the job she was assigned, and now people were leaving her alone to just let her do it. So that was a bit of a relief uh, from all of the pre-flight stress that she was under, uh, and carrying, you know, this you know responsibility that you know, you know, in hindsight, people may not have appreciated, you know, the that stress that she was under, and that she did it. Now, post-flight, the stress, um, maybe it wasn't quite as important to her to uh, see how to say this. Um, she, was, she had a lot of obligations placed on her 
which I think she did not necessarily feel obligated to accept, which would have been different, you know, before the flight, you know, the obligations, you pretty much have no choice. Uh, after the flight, um, she felt at least some discretion to pick and choose the things she wanted to do. And that by itself was probably stressful. Dealing with, you know, a variety of requests for her presence that, you know, for whatever reason, she wasn't really interested in doing. Seems like she was interested in the ones where she could make a difference in inspiring others and inspiring yes. in particular young Young women. girls, mm -hmm. right. Um, and, you know, things that perhaps, you know, the White House wanted her to do were not, you know, in that same category. You know, if she's, awesome. if she's being asked to <laughs> fulfill someone else's objective, then she wasn't necessarily on board. But if it was something where she could fulfill one of her objectives, then she would happily do it. So she wasn't a political pawn. She tried not to be, yes. Whether she was or not, at times I think she probably was, but, mm -hmm. but that was not something that she <clears throat> wanted and, and sometimes wouldn't accept. That makes me like her even more. <laughs> <laughs> and what about Steve Hawley? What do you, from your career, want to be remembered for? And what do you think people may not know is of significance to you? Well, I don't know. I guess I've always um, wanted, particularly, you know, kids in Kansas to know that even if you grew up in a small town in central Kansas, <clears throat> you can do some really amazing things and be given some amazing opportunities. And so I want, I want kids to know that. Um, and again, I, the, another thing I suppose is that, as I said, in my case, you know, being an astronaut was not something that I thought was possible. Some I thought about, but I didn't think it was a realistic goal um, today it is, but the message that I, I share with particularly kids again is, uh, you know, you may not know what opportunities you'll encounter as you grow up and, and do things. And the, <clears throat> the trick, I suppose, is to be as prepared as you can possibly be to take advantage of those opportunities. You know, I was lucky. I, I was given this opportunity and I was prepared to uh, meet the requirements that NASA had at the time, um, even though it had not been my plan to grow up and apply to be an astronaut. Just, you know, be, you know, be as good as you can be at all of the things that are make you eligible to do things you might not imagine you'd have the chance to do. Wow, I'm feeling like a real slug right now. <laughs> like the underperformer in the room. <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to add? Well, I, I still find it sort of remarkable that, you know, I, I don't re recall whether I said earlier, you know, yeah, I wanted to be an astronomer when I was a kid and I followed the space program closely and I thought about telescopes in space. Um, I'd also thought that if we actually had observatories in space, we would want astronomers to go operate those telescopes. And I thought, okay, so there may be this small chance that, you know, if I were an astronomer and was in good shape and, you know, all of that, I could go operate a telescope in space. And of course that uh, didn't happen because I didn't foresee that you don't actually have to go there. <laughs> you can send the data to the ground, which is what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the end, I did get to work with telescopes in space. And so, you know, that dream sort of came true. And again, maybe that's just another thing for kids to think about is, is you know, your dream may sound crazy, but <laughs> it could actually come true if you pursue it and, and do the things you need to do to uh, keep it as realistic as possible. Right, because that was not, there wasn't a, any basis in reality for you to have that dream. Nobody was doing that. No one was doing that. At the time. Correct. 
And that's what is not just important to students to remember, but to all the adults who encounter those students. Yeah. That it may not be as far-fetched as it sounds. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know if other people were, well, obviously other people were thinking about putting telescopes in space. I didn't, didn't know any of them, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could have a crazy idea and, you know, maybe you could make it come true. Absolutely. Well, we're grateful. We're grateful you're in Kansas, grateful you're a friend of the Cosmosphere and that you make time to visit with me. I, I always appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Well, I think that's good as far as I'm concerned. I um, didn't necessarily want to tell the, the story. I wouldn't have minded, but it, mm -hmm. it seemed like it was maybe not totally relevant. But I was something reminded me the other day um, Sally and I had gone to California for a weekend. Do you want me to cut? No, nah, that's right. Okay. Um, and I don't remember exactly when it was. I think it was in April of 82, might have been. But um, we went to Disneyland for one day, and then we spent another day at her parents' house. And... Uh, then she got a call that she needed to report back to Georgia's office Monday morning. And that was an issue because um, we had flown out together, but I was going home on Sunday to go to work on Monday, and she was going to stay an extra day. And um, now she has to go home on Sunday. And these were our tickets, not NASA's tickets. You know, we had paid for these. And so I was trying to figure out, you know, what to do. And I, I called the airline and I said, hey, can I just, can we just swap tickets? And they go, and that's not how it works. <laughs> and so uh, I realized that, you know, her ticket said S Ride on it and my ticket said S Holly on it. And so I just gave her my ticket, which was for the Sunday trip home. And so I went home on Monday as Steve Ride. <laughs> so I could use her ticket. Now, back in the day, they didn't check IDs or anything. You're right, I'd probably gone to jail. <laughs> <laughs> but that but, was great but, problem solving. <laughs> but the reason they wanted her back was they were telling her she was gonna going to be the one, be the one to fly a CS7. Hmm. Didn't you two, uh, if I remember the story from the Coffee at the Cosmo correctly, didn't you... Uh, I don't know if you call it check out a T-38, but somehow you got your hands on a T-38 during the eclipse. Wasn't that you oh, and yeah. Sally? And Sally and Pinky. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember. I think it was Pinky's idea originally mm -hmm. um, to go chase the eclipse uh, in the jets. And we both thought that sounded like fun. And so we tried to com come up with a rationale <laughs> that we could sell to management for why we should do this. And, you know, we argued that, oh, well, you know, it's a, like a lot of the stuff that we'll be expected to do, you know, when we're assigned to a mission, you know, we're flight planning, we're taking data in a dynamic environment, we're having to coordinate with a bunch of other people, and, and George ended up buying it. I don't know that he <laughs> bought our argument, but he told us we could do it. And so we got three pilot volunteers, Hoot was one, Mike Coates was one, and Dick Scobie was one. <clears throat> and we flew up to Montana, and the next day it was February 79. I don't remember the specific date. Yeah, we took off from uh, Air Force Base in Montana and flew the eclipse track and, and got pictures, which at that time was a little bit unusual. There hadn't been a lot of airplane uh, chases of eclipses with photography. So... You know, I don't know that there's a lot of science that was <laughs> learned from our pictures, but at least they were a little bit unique that, you know, pictures of an eclipse taken from an airplane. Uh, and when we, we recovered into South Dakota, into Rapid City, Ellsworth Air Force Base, which is, of course, right by Mount Rushmore. And so the next day we took off to fly back home and we had a little film left. So we took pictures of Mount Rushmore as we were <laughs> leaving. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was kind of a boondoggle, but we, we did manage to sell it as a training exercise. <laughs> and, I love that. And how old were you then? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, 
guess I just turned 27. Yeah. What a fun, I mean, you know, some kids might think it's great to, in their 20s, go on a year rail pass uh, across Europe and you checked out jets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as it turns out, that's what we did.